Greetings. How are you, Frank? Okay. I'd like to share one little facet of my work with the B.F. Goodrich Company. They were manufacturing automotive components that went into the making of the beautiful decorated seating in the automobiles. Sewn to the upholstery fabric is a polyurethane pad that has been shaped very much to their design so that when the the upholstery was sewn to the pad it created these lovely embossed appearances in the seats and the seat backs. The pads had to be routed. That is, there had to be a, a narrow strip of the polyurethane taken out of the pad so that the sewing machine could sew the, the, the fabric, the upholstery, into that little crevice. When I was introduced to the project, they were removing the polyurethane with gang saws. There could be as many as 24 routes in a pad that would be 60 inches wide. And it created an enormous amount of polyurethane dust that had to be vacuumed and cleaned and then sent to the, the GM sewing department where the dust was in a uh, consistent aggravation in gumming up the sewing machine. And I said, well, why do we make all the dust? Why don't we do it dustless? And I devised a system of hot wire. It's the nichrome wire that is used in all of the heating elements in our homes and businesses. And I shaped and supplied the appropriate amount of electrical power so that these little wires would glow hot and then the pad would simply be passed on a table under this row of cutters and the little strips would be taken out in single sticky little pieces and the finished product had absolutely no dust. This was so attractive to General Motors that they offered to buy all of the product that B.F. Goodrich could produce because it was to their liking and they would have to buy from other providers the balance of their need. And that was, of course, a wonderful boon to the profitability of B.F. Goodrich. But it's just one of the simple little things that I thought outside the box and managed to discover how to do it. Others had tried and hadn't succeeded, but with the initiative and persistence that God has given me to solve little problems, that became a major success and a benefit to my employer. Hey there. I have been around a long time. I have many stories. I have been there and done that and enjoyed myself along the way. The joys, challenges, struggles, and triumphs that we all have experienced through our lives 
are a bond that we have in common with every generation, sharing the commonalities of our life experiences brings us closer to regeneration. Hey, you out there, get ready. Join me and many others on this show. Our host is John Knox. Greetings, I am John Knox. This is Sharing Life. This is Season 4, Episode 7. This episode is called Frank Buchanan, An Innovative Life. Support for Sharing Life comes from APEC Marketing. To consult their services, go to apecmarketing.com. By email, contact asha at apecmarketing.com. APEC Marketing, your resource for digital marketing, web, and app development tools. Serving others was demonstrated, modeled for us by my parents and my wife's parents. We come out of a caring community where these are high values and selfishness is not a value at all. Frank is going to tell us how he came into his own, on how he came to capitalize on his own strengths. Listen to his subtle comments. Frank is an achiever and powerful in his voice, so his disappointments are not easily heard. But he too had to go on a long journey in order to mature into being the competent person that he is today. This is Frank Buchanan with the Sharing Life Podcast. Frank, how are you today? I'm just fine today, John. So I'm interviewing you. Uh, primarily to learn from your work ethic and from the personal things from your life. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to share about your uh, common everyday life and your spiritual life that informs your work ethic and about your childhood. Okay, well, it's Frank Buchanan, and I say tongue-in-cheek. I was born in Sarnia at a very early age so that I would be near my mother. And from then, my earliest recollections of life are living in Toronto at the corner of Welland and St. Clair. From there, my father and older brother would walk down to 100 Bloor Street East and attend People's Church. Now, the rationale in our walking was that I would probably survive Sunday school and be sound asleep for church. Preferred, because I was a very active child. From Toronto, we moved into rural Ontario, a little town called Coe Hill. It's up north of Bancroft a little bit. There, my dad pastoral congregations. He was given an, op- an opportunity to work in the United Church in 1937. Employment was extremely rare, and Dad was given the opportunity to replace a pastor in that community that had to move away because of ill health of his wife. And we experienced the Depression firsthand. Mm. The community was very financially challenged to the point where it was literally life-threatening for some. From there, we moved to other rural communities in southern Ontario, namely Kimberley in the Beaver Valley, and later to Ravenna up on the east side of 
the Beaver Valley. And while we lived at Kimberly, my father managed my grandfather's farm at Van Leeuwen, a very small farm, cows, horses, pigs, chickens, sheep, and had a very interesting woodlot. And in 1942, I had my first broken bone. We were loading logs with a jammer, and one of them didn't arrive safely on the truck and came down and landed right where I was. The next year, I went to my first out-of-house employment. The Easter holiday, I spent making maple syrup on another farm, this time on the west side of the Beaver Valley. And there, I worked and lived with that family for two full summers. My wages were an outstanding one dollar per day. And I worked six days a week. Following that, I attended high school in Thornbury. And there I had a part-time job working in the hardware store. And my wages were a stupendous 25 cents an hour. And that's where I was introduced to the oil business. In those days, oil-fired space heaters became the novelty. And I delivered oil in the trunk of my boss's car in five-gallon cans so that people had oil heat. Okay, from there, I attended high school rather unsuccessfully. I spent two years in grade 13 and didn't succeed in finishing well. Now, I followed a, a very brilliant older brother who completed his grade 13 when he was 16 years old. Frank was very different. How do you handle setbacks and looking worse than your siblings? Frank just lived through moving from the city of Toronto to rural Ontario to making another big move. Frank was being sent off to another school. Is Frank an academic? What does he tell you? Where are his strengths? Before we move on, take a moment to listen to the cost of his yearly tuition and the gas for his road trip. What did Frank gain from the time at the institution that he studied at in self-esteem and in opportunities? And eventually, I ended up going to a residential school in Alberta. One of the main attractions about going to Alberta was that it was a long way from home. And I had the privilege of driving a brand new Meteor car from a dealership in Toronto to a used car lot dealer in Calgary. Interestingly, it took $42.50 for the gasoline for the whole trip. Now, arriving in Alberta, I was attending a residential school, and just by way of interest, room and board tuition, the whole package, was $360 for a year. And there, I spent seven years. Not exactly because I was a slow learner, but I studied and spent time working for the school. My farm experience qualified me to help on the farm. From there, I moved into steam vetting and firing industrial boilers. 
the school heated 100 buildings with one steam generator. So you can understand that it was a major, a major enterprise. And there I also was introduced to printing. I was the Armstrong paper cutter and cut tons and tons of paper for various publications that they produced. When I finished my work at the school, I went to Banff to work for the summer, three summers, 54, 55, and 56. And there I contracted the parking responsibility for the Banff Springs Hotel. I hired my own employees, people I could trust, and we had a very successful run at the Banff Springs Hotel. By this time, I was married and had two children. At that point, we moved to Quebec, and I served in another residential school, handman, farmer, Mr. Fixit, and doer of all kinds of odds and ends. Next stage was moving into B.F. Goodrich. He had a, an expanded cellular rubber operation in that area. And I was hired to be the incentive earnings manager. I would evaluate the job, and I would set the production level that would earn 100% wages, and the company was willing to pay an extra 20% on the union contract for 20% extra production. And my ability to work skillfully with my hands gave me the qualification to do that. And then the B.F. Goodrich Company moved me back to Ontario in 1970, which I thought at the time would be temporary. But here we are, these few years later, and I'm still here. And in Ontario, after my experience with B.F. Goodridge, I joined an Italian company that was recycling lead from scrap batteries. And this week, in 2020, marks 45 years and I have been with the company doing basically the same thing that I went there to do. And my work ethic and my business principles have endeared me to the company through multiple ownerships there because I don't see rewarding anybody for being there, but rather reward them for the work that they accomplish. And that has given me a privilege in a company that is staffed by union employees to be outside the union and given permanence in the place just because of the way we do our work. So that's basically who I am, where I've come from, and where I am now. That was a short history of Frank's life from being a country boy from the city. Can you count all the jobs that Frank did? The list includes farming, small entrepreneurial ventures, a dollar a day working on a maple syrup farm including room and board, and 25 cents per hour working at a small hardware store in the 1940s. He also worked in the oil business, steam fitting boilers, a school maintenance department, publishing, 
Banff Springs Hotel, a school maintenance department again, B.F. Goodrich as an incentive earnings manager, and a lead battery recycler company. Even though Frank was not thinking highly of his academic value in school, his innovative nature became very obvious in every task he assumed due to his schooling. Listen in and you will soon hear about a best friend of Frank's. First, we are going to hear more about Frank's father. My father was an interesting entrepreneur. He was persuaded and repeatedly encouraged us three boys that nothing is as good as it can be. Everything can be improved if you just take the the attention to understand it and think through the improvements. Just nothing is set in stone, just everything is open for reinvention and refining. And that has led to all of the things that I've been involved in where I've been able to challenge the status quo and bring some improvement to the seat. And happily, I was able to involve my family, my children, in many of the projects that I undertook and gave each of the children meaningful income right out of our own household. Now, there have been various occasions when I have reached out to help others, uh, very close personal friends for many years. Uh, my friend Rick Buller was uh, occupant of a wheelchair for the major part of his life and the whole time that I knew him. And again, Rick was creative. He was a repairman. And he was the brains and I was the legs so that we together could accomplish rather interesting projects for others. He was my best friend, I would say, for those many years. Another part of my life has been the caring for my wife that was necessitated by their illnesses. My first wife had cancer and we coped with the cancer for seven years until she passed away. My second wife was taken with Lou Gehrig's disease and that again gave me opportunity to do some very intensive caring for five years. And then more recently, I was married again and walked carefully with this dear woman for seven years while she became weaker and weaker and finally went to her reward. So caring has been a very important part of my life. And the fact that I grew up with no sisters, mother insisted that we boys learn to do all the things that girls learned to do when they were young. So we knit and we sewed and we cooked and we washed and we churned cream into butter and did the housekeeping so that these chores were never irksome or a burden to me when I needed to do them in more recent years. And right now I'm contentedly housed in a senior residence, very small accommodation, 
but I was given permission to bring my carving equipment into the residence here. Management knew my equipment and knew me and discovered that they had a suite right next to the elevator mechanism so that the elevator makes noises and my carving equipment makes noises and the people outside the apartment can't tell whether it's the elevator or my carving. Oh, that's awesome. So it, it's just an amazing provision for a, a tinkerer to carry on inventing, solving problems and improving ideas at this later stage of my life. Being 90 doesn't eliminate my ability and willingness to think and improve. After 90 years of challenges and well-earned victories at work and at home, Frank is now ready for more challenges and improvement. He even sharpened his tech skills to a new level with the help of some friends. Well, I really appreciate your tenacity. Recently, we were moving my grandma's apartment and you were part of that. And I was just so thankful. And it was just really interesting watching your strength. No. One little undertaking that is very recent. Uh, I've been using computers for years and years. I, you know, go back to the old DOS systems and I'm now using the more sophisticated recent programs. But I've had a desire to publish meditations that a fellow senior in my church has been composing for the last 40 years. They have been distributed through hard copy and snail mail for years. My concept was to make them more broadly available electronically through a website. Now, I have not mastered the Internet technology. I have appealed to capable, younger friends that make that their specialty. But at the present time, I have a website that is dedicated to these meditations. There are currently nearly 300 of them posted, and I'm still catching up on older ones and publishing the current one. This is a, an ongoing project that is perhaps more beneficial to others than anything I've ever done. The site is very simple www.encouragement, numeral four, letter U, dot C-A. And there, there are several divisions that are separated by the years in which they were composed but readily available to anyone who has a computer and knows how to use it. So far, we have heard how Frank has come into his own strength, how he took advantage of his years at school, a list of his work experience, and heard about his father's encouragement. We are in the last segment of the episode, the roots of Frank's victorious spirit are again being made more clear. In this segment, we will now hear how failure ended for Frank through God's equipping him. 
we will then hear a summary of the cost of three words, one of the meditations on Frank's website, encouragementforyou.ca. Remember to go to his website to find more grounding encouragement that will lift you up. Look to the show notes for exact spelling. After hearing that meditation, we will sign out with joy. Thanks for sticking around. One of your questions to me was about education. Yeah. I'm not strong on book learning. And as you understand, leaving Ontario and going to Alberta was a very definite break from continual failure or unachieving to a season in my life that seemed to be more positive and productive. And I attribute the change in my attitude to something I learned in my first plenary session at the school in Alberta. And the text at that occasion was the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. That comes from Job 2828. And in my spirit, my response was, that's something I can do. It is, in fact, my purpose to fear the Lord and to avoid evil. And with the mentors and encouragers and the opportunity to work in the in the school, I was able to achieve that and I'm eternally grateful for for the the purpose that God gave me along with the gifts in order to serve others. So that is what God used to bring change and purpose into my life. It seems like you really changed from being somebody just living life to somebody with direct purpose. Absolutely. That's a correct analysis of what I was and who I became. So how did that work ethic of yours infiltrate all of life? So many people are in the workforce working really hard, but when they come home, there's a disconnect. How, how was it for you in your family life and raising your kids? And Well, we, we were a very happy family. My first wife and I had six children, and they followed the family principle of diligence and consistency. And it just, it just proved to be productive, creative, and a blessing to others. That's really encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. So how did it feel emotionally to be a caregiver? Like I, under, like I have a friend who was taking care of his parents as they were passing away, and it nearly killed him. How was it for you... And taking care of your wives when they had such uh, difficult conditions? Well, difficult conditions is an understatement. But I was content to serve unconditionally in the face of great need. And I just thank God for patience and understanding and the ability to 
invent ways of meeting the needs, the physical needs of people that were very infirm. And serving others was demonstrated, modeled for us by my parents and my wife's parents. We come out of a caring community where these are high values and selfishness is not not a value at all. So I'm just grateful for for what what has transpired and it's not because of any personal merit but it's willingness to take the humble the servant attitude and just continue with diligence over and over and over and over and for that i find great reward okay i'm going to share with you the most recent of the meditations that i have the privilege of posting for an elderly friend that I have worked with for many years. The title of this one is The Cost of Three Words. When I went to my prayer chair in my prayer corner this morning, suddenly I wasn't there. I was back at Calvary. My heart was bleeding tears as I began to probe the cost of the costliest, most important, riches-filled and triumphant three words ever uttered in all of human history. While he was drinking the cup, a terrorizing icy chill of loneliness began to fill his soul and body Shortly before, he had been in the warm embrace of his loving Father and the Holy Spirit. But now, no love and no warmth. Listen to this from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14. For many the servant of God became an object of horror. Many were astonished at him. His face and his whole appearance were marred more than any man's and his form beyond that of the sons of men. The holy, spotless, unblemished Passover lamb of God became one big, misshapen, revolting blemish. Right now, I'm clinging closely to the Holy Spirit because I know that I'm speaking of holy things. I desperately need his clear guidance. I fear the danger of misrepresenting sacred eternal truth. Do we dare say that very small, quote, almost insignificant sins don't matter? Many people still don't know that he was wounded for our transgressions. Because he was broken and spilled out, we can be made whole. He finished restoring what Adam threw away. He finished making full atonement for our sin. He finished removing every obstacle to salvation in your way and mine and gave us free entry into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of the living God. The animal sacrifices had been a temporary IOU against an outstanding debt. He finished all that permanently 
by paying our full sin debt once for all. His victorious, triumphant three words were an essential proclamation to principalities and powers and also to sinners. He finished everything the Father gave him to do. When we enter the Holy of Holies in the high and holy place to pray, do we pause in worship, wonder, and gratitude for the tremendous cost of the three words? Think, ponder, meditate. If Jesus had not reached that point when with his last breath he could say, it is finished, then no Bible, no prayer. But he finished and earned the right to say those powerful three words. And that is why salvation is God's free gift. We could never work for, earn, or merit salvation. And he offers eternal life freely to anyone who chooses to put their faith in him. We need to be on guard in these critical times that we don't let well-known truth become so familiar that we can take it lightly and don't pay much attention to it. Each and every day, those victorious three words should have a real bearing on our lives, thoughts, words, and actions. What effect are they have on you and me today. I will never be able to fathom to plumb the depths of the intense suffering and incalculable love of our triune God, which gave birth to the priceless three words. But I long to be led deeper, don't you? God made sanctification to be progressive because my inheritance in Jesus is God's lifetime investment in me. If I am wise and obedient steward of my inheritance, every day the Holy Spirit pays out to me the rich dividends of my inheritance. The result in the glory of God because my riches in Christ enable me to live to the praise of his glory. Why would I ever choose to live as a spiritual pauper? There can be no inheritance unless there has been a death. So Jesus died. God's Lavish investment in us reveals his glorious purpose for us, which is to make you and me like Jesus. Amen. You have been listening to Sharing Life. To contact me, use my email address, sharinglifestudios at gmail.com. Also, I have an independent board who reviews all decisions concerning these broadcasts. Thank you for being a listener. The one thing that comforts me more than any other thought, there is absolutely nothing on the list under the title if only I had. That's good. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, John. Well, it's been a pleasure. Okay, lovely speaking with you. Thank you for your time. Okay. God bless. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.
That's it.